but I was, my wife says I took it. I didn't do a good job handling it. Mm. I don't know. I didn't know how to react. Yeah. I mean, I don't think I would, I thought, is this going to last forever? Is he going to, you know, it was the uncertainty. Something that mom said too on the podcast last time was when you got home, you weren't like back to normal. Do you remember that when I got back? But what I also experienced before the hospital and after the hospital was not thinking you guys were you. Like but, thinking but, that mom, here's, here's another one that I've never shared. Dad, welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm glad super to be here. Yeah, I'm really excited to have you here. Last week I had mom on or a week before and okay. just to talk about some of the mental health stuff that a lot of my audience knows about. And I thought it'd be really good after doing that interview or conversation to just bring the whole family on and, you know, see everyone's opinion. So starting with the parents and then working through the rest of the kids. It'll be interesting to see how the the very variations of perceptions of what you went through. Right, because everyone sees it through their own eyes, exactly. has their own opinion, experience. So that's going to be really cool. Before we jump into it, I'd love for you to just share a little bit about yourself uh, for our audience who is literally meeting you for the first time. Uh, how in depth or, you know. Whatever you want to share, a couple minutes. Okay, grew up in New Jersey, uh, wound up going to college in Pennsylvania, uh, played football in college, did well. Uh, wound up working in corporate America for a while, realized I was the square peg in the round hole and got involved with starting my own little marketing company. Did that for about 15, 20 years. And after that, I retired basically. And just nice. Did little odds and ends here and there. But I worked in marketing, helping Fortune 500 companies with different marketing aspects. And that was a lot of fun. That was back in the days of where you met people face to face. Right. <laughs> we don't do that anymore. Yeah. So that was my strength. I enjoyed, I was the, the liaison between our creative group and the customer. Okay. And so my strength, I think, was listening to the customer because I was in the Fortune 500, translating that to what they wanted. And I was pretty right on all the time because I came for them from that area. Okay. Yeah. And then, uh, didn't want to have kids for a while, got married late, was married at 34. And after we were together for six years, we looked at each other and said, hmm, maybe there should be someone else around. <laughs> and that's when we had our first child when I was 40. Wow. And when I think about it now, if I didn't have kids, my life would be very empty because mm. the kids are, are my life. Yeah. And fortunately, we have kids that are great and they still like us. <laughs> <laughs> and I think what's interesting, too, is we're all here in right. Arizona. Exactly. So you get to see us on a day to day basis, maybe more so than, than sometimes people. you like, too. No, 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 no. <laughs> uh, it, there's never too much seeing our kids too much. It, yeah. It, it, like I, I remember hearing people who were my peers saying they didn't want to have kids. And I sort of understand that from one side, but I wonder how they feel now that they're older. And as you get older, you don't have as many friends, I don't think, as when you were younger mm -hmm. and they have no family. Yeah. That's got to be an empty feeling. Yeah. And I think another interesting thing about our family is, and I've heard this now from a lot of different people who are friends of ours. Uh, uh, yeah. They say, you guys are all so different. How do you see <laughs> us all? Because we all do a lot of different things. But how do you think about that from the kids? What's interesting is you really realize how weird DNA is. Mm. The kids come from the same two parents and they're all different for whatever reason. I don't know. God intends people to be their own person, but all our kids are different. We have two kids who are spendthrifts. They love to just go out and spend money. Then we have two kids who are very judicious about money and taking care of things. So they're Two on one side, two on the other side. Right. It's really interesting. And obviously, Dane knows who I'm talking about. It's just, it's amazing. Yeah. It's, uh, I think the younger kids learned from the older kids' mistakes. That's mm -hmm. what it seems like. Totally. And for those of you who are listening who don't know, we have three brothers in the family or boys in the family and one older sister. I'm in the middle. 
Younger brother is Sean, older brother is Ross, older sister is Danielle, who you all will meet on this show <laughs> at a future date. How do you think about everyone's career choices? Because we've all done such different things. And being a dad who grew up in a completely different generation of having a path waved for you that was very in line with, I guess, what other people would do. But now in this world we live in, it's completely different and we've all taken different paths. But how do you see that in just with all of us and what we're doing today? Very different. Back in my day, you went to college, you did it in four years. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was pretty straightforward. And you did have jobs waiting for you where that isn't the case so much anymore. Um, I, w I found it interesting that none of my kids really had a college experience, mm. like where you live on a campus and you're integrated into what's going on in the milieu of the college. None of them had that. Yeah. Uh, two of them graduated from college and two of them didn't. Uh, one aside I have to mention, like, I was a quarterback in high school. Not one of my boys could throw a ball. Anyway, that's just an aside. I found that interesting. They all turned out to be good football players, but they couldn't throw a ball. Um, the path they've taken is interesting. Uh, they're, they're all doing entrepreneurial endeavors, which I think is great and very appropriate to this time and space, you know, what's going yeah. on in the world. Uh, I think... Two of them are somewhat happy in what they're doing. Well, three of them are. My, my older son, he's doing a job that he's, he does well, but he's yeah. not feeling that this is his thing. Yeah. Whereas Dane, I think, is on a path to, and we'll get into this probably a little later, doing some really cool stuff, and he's really happy about what he's doing. Uh, I have a daughter who is trying to get in show business. She was a professional wrestler, uh, and then that sort of went away because of changes in the, the WWE. She, she's still finding her way. Yeah. You know, she does commercials. She does things like that. But I still think she's, you know, unsure of where she is and where she's going. Yeah. And plus the fact that she's a little older and she's worrying about having kids. She's 35 and she's not married and there's no guy in the horizon right now. <laughs> um, and then the youngest son, he, he's done a lot of entrepreneurial stuff on his own. He has an Amazon business that's doing very well. Also working for people where he's consulting. Yeah. So it's across the board. So different, all of them. Right. It's been really cool to see Sean's career unfold because <laughs> he was the one who kind of had that big opportunity with football, Naval Academy, full ride scholarship, right. gets stripped because of an injury, comes home, needs to figure out what he wants to do. And then at that time I was, you know, in fitness and stuff, I was going to college and I just really inspired him to <clears throat> pursue entrepreneurial interests. And he started doing that. And it's really cool to see where that's got him because he has such a good skill in knowing how to do something that's very valuable in the marketplace. Right, right. And people are seeing that not only in what he's built for himself, but what other businesses value that he can then work and consult with too. So I'm really proud of him. It'll be exciting to see. And like you said too, Danielle's figuring it out. She's done so many amazing things. Right. <laughs> and I feel like her talent just shows whenever she gets an opportunity and shows up, it's her on. She's so good at delivering that message, all the different production things that she's done, on-air talent, sports broadcasting, right. Cardinals cheerleader. Like, <laughs> it's just so wild to see. And then you get, I think in that space, it's interesting because then something doesn't come. What do you do now? So her finding that next thing will be interesting to see. And then with Ross, he's so creative and he's built his own thing when it comes to sharing that. And he's at a job which provides him an income, but that creative entrepreneurial spirit is the thing he wants to be doing full-time, which is cool to be around with him because Sean and I live with him. So you know, we're all always working and talking about things. Uh, but yeah, I think everyone's kind of figuring it out, which is great. I want to go ahead. Two comments. One on Danielle. Danielle's personality is sort of like mine. I'm very up and down. Mm. She's very up and down. When she's up and doing work, like Dane said, she's full on. When it dries up, sometimes she has problems getting herself motivated. Yeah. She's my personality. Back to Sean. What 
I found out with him in the Naval Academy, he had his group of friends when he played football. When that went away because he got hurt, he felt very isolated. Mm. All his friends were playing football. He wasn't anymore. Yeah. So that's what sort of stopped him from pursuing it to the end, you know, graduating. Yeah. And I, I understand that. Yeah. Because he just, he lost all his buddies. Right. You know, and then you're, and a lot of the players down there, I may be speaking at a turn, but I don't think so. They sort of resented the athletes. Yeah. Because they got a little more spe special treatment. And I'll tell you, the, the Naval Academy, Oral Academy is tough as hell. Mm -hmm. They're going from five in the morning till, till lights go out. Yeah. It's full time. So football was actually a break. <laughs> when they talk about other universities, kids are saying, oh, we got to go to football practice at the academy. Oh, we're going to football practice. <laughs> we're getting away from the regiment. Right. So it was really an outlet. And then that was taken away. Yeah. I remember those, all, yeah. those long conversations with him on the phone where he's just <laughs> not super happy, right. especially when he was separated from right. the team. Cause now you're in the, just the general population of people yep. who might have different thoughts about you. Cause like you said, you're a football player. I'm curious because we're here lit with Dane podcasts, whatever you want to <laughs> call it. What do you think about what I'm doing? Just because I think I was the one kid who took the most normal route in the form of I went to college, got a degree, and then went into corporate America after fitness kind of phasing out. And God really blessed that. And I think grandpa saw that too, because he was like, Dane's doing this. Right, he would always right. look at me and then kind of look at the other kids like, why aren't you doing something like this? <laughs> exactly. But I had that and it was blessed. And then I eventually stepped away to pursue this, which is sharing my faith, social media, content creation, a lot of uncertainty. How do you think about that? Or what did you think about when I started? And how do you think about it now? Well, first of all, when he went to work in corporate, I guess we can call it corporate America, I wasn't surprised that you did very well. Dane is the only child who listened to me, <laughs> i.e., when I used to say to them, the way you're going to turn out is who you hang around with and what you read. He took that message of what you read to the nth degree and started reading and reading and reading, probably when he was, what, 17, 18 years old? Yeah. That reading set, 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 set a foundation for him to be successful in anything he wanted to do. That translated over to when he was working in corporate, or yeah. when you were working in corporate. I'm talking like you're not here. <laughs> um, and it, that didn't surprise me that he was, because that energy, that positive attitude he had just permeated the people he was working with and also permeated the people he was working to elicit business from. And it just worked. Yeah. This diversion going off into this is, it surprised me, I guess. Yeah. It just came to me sort of out of nowhere and it's been very successful and that doesn't surprise me either. Yeah. Cause you're, you're so positive that people have to react to you in a positive way or you may have the naysayers that say, oh, who, this guy's too positive. And there are those people out there. So it doesn't surprise me too much that you went out on your own thing. Yeah. Did you think, because I because I was doing this while I had my job right. for the first two years. This was more of just, hey, I feel called to do this. On the side, I'm going right. to do it on the side. My career kept evolving. And then I made that decision to leave. When I told you guys I was going to quit my job, what did you think? Uh. I thought it probably was a little premature Yeah, because his company was acquired and now he was working for a new company that was much larger, much more structured. So I could see where you didn't like the structure as much as where you were in the beginning. Yeah. Uh, I thought he should have, you should have stayed. Why am I talking? <laughs> you're not here. That you should have stayed maybe another year just to see how it fell out. Yeah. And, but who am I to t tell you what to do? You're, you're an adult. Yeah. So your decision obviously worked out, uh, not notwithstanding that if you stayed another year, that might have been good too. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, because I was wrestling with the decision to say, right. let me go even, let me just go join another startup, right? Do that over again because that, that gave me that entrepreneurial right, right. environment to live in where you could contribute and make a difference. And then I really felt led to say, why don't I just step away and see what could come from this? So, Because the company that acquired you was a big company. 
This is massive. Yeah, yeah. so it was not a startup anymore. It was 12,000 employees. Yeah. No. <laughs> and, their, and their parent company was 34,000. Right. So the team I was on was 7,000 alone. And I came from a company that had 200. Right, that was it. And 200, yeah, that I was surprised. But I understand the desire for a startup. That's got to be so much more exciting than a company that's already big and thriving. Yeah, and I think with you and mom, something that I really appreciated was you guys just wanted us to pursue what we felt led to do. Right, right. You would give us guidance and stuff and general things to look at, but you wanted us to be happy doing something that made us happy. And that was really important based, instead of forcing what you thought we should do. Right, right. How do you think about that with even parenting kids or helping someone develop their path? Well, I think, I think that old axiom, you know, follow your passion and everything will be fine, isn't true. Right. Because you can follow a passion that has no money or no income and you're going to be not surviving. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I don't buy that totally. Finding your passion, if you could make a living out of it, yeah, that makes sense. Because then you don't work another day in your life because you're always right. doing something you love. Um, so hopefully, uh, obviously, you did find something that you can survive on and follow because it turned John and you really get excited about it. Yeah. A lot of people don't, you know, you have these teachers that, oh, I have a passion for teaching. And then after a few years, they're sitting there saying, I don't want to do this anymore. Mm -hmm. And so they're sort of lost because yeah. they followed their passion. So it's a, it's a sl slippery slope of following your passion. Right. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. Yeah, totally. I look at it as more of what kind of skill can you develop that there you, you enjoy that can turn into something that you could also then consider your passion. Right. Because the skill that I looked at wasn't necessarily a passion. It was, I was just an encouraging individual. Right. And that encouragement could be pointed at working with people in sales or this or that, which I think makes it a little bit easier for people who are saying, what is that passion that I have? It's more of like, well, what's that gift or that skill that's on your life that can be translated to something else? Before even I got into this career, and something I wanted to talk to you about today was I was in fitness and then a huge <laughs> crisis happened with this mental health thing that I talked to about mom, but I wanted to bring you on too to kind of get your perspective of when that started happening, when did you actually start noticing? Because mom shared her perspective, but when did you start noticing something was off? I don't know if I can pinpoint that. What was interesting is Dane was, you know, all that reading talking about how that propelled him to where he is today, I think it it overstimulated him there for a while. I mean, he was reading so much and getting so excited and talking about taking everything to the next degree and, the te you know, extrapolating, getting more, uh, I don't know what you would want to call it, more motivated. And he started becoming hyper. And I that's, I guess, when we noticed it in the beginning, he became very hyper. And, you know, you it, people who listen to him, you think he talks fast now. You should have listened to him <laughs> talking then. And then that sort of just spiraled out. And I, I can't remember the first, I think the first time was he was very, very hyper. And, you know, we, we were at our house one night and he's talking, talking, and it seemed like something was wrong. Yeah. And I went to bed and I made the mistake of not telling everyone else, hey, hide the car keys. You remember that? Yeah. And they didn't hide the car keys. And we wake up and he's gone. Mm -hmm. That's when it really went off the edge. Yeah. He was going to go to L.A. And I, I forget what, what was your motivation for going to L.A. exactly? I think it was a lot of things in that because that was deep delusion at yeah. that point. Yeah. And it just might have not seen or you might not have seen it that way, but I was in the thick of it at that moment when I left. Yeah. Like I would. I, you remember I would tell you guys like there are people there are. There are, uh, there are cameras in the house. There's right, people falling. Right. Even remember when I came home from LA and I just got so mad at you. Yep. Do you remember that experience? That was way before me leaving. You, I, right. You went to LA for something else. Then you came back. And that's when everything started you getting. you stole the car. <laughs> and still yeah. Took the car. Yeah. And we get a call, uh, I guess in the morning, uh, your son's in the hospital. What? Uh, do you want me to go into that yeah. whole thing? Yeah. Go for it. And we get a call and I guess we we're talking. Well, I guess we went to the hospital and he's pretty 
spacey and delusional or whatever you want to call it. And we were talking to the cop and he's saying, you know, Dane was on the freeway and he came around the corner and hit the car against a, one of those bumpers. Then he stopped the car, fortunately, I guess. And he started running down the highway. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> fortunately, someone saw him, called the police and they came and got him. And I guess he was not so crazy that he gave the cops a hard time. They they right. took him to the hospital and and that's when everything started to get opened up about what was going on. Yeah. See, that's interesting too because I can remember all of these moments before that happened where now that I can see it from this perspective versus being in it, right? I of and again, I know <laughs> what this is now and that mental health crisis I went through, I would have been like, there is something severely wrong with- If you were looking from the outside. Yeah, because, but you guys had never experienced something like that. You didn't have anything when it came to mental health or uh, what that is supposed to look like or seem. And probably what made it hard was I was already kind of like a fast talker and that was my natural personality. Right, right. So it could be disguised in a way where, oh, he's just a little bit more excited today. Right, that's, you know? that's true. I remember him, Dane, you telling us, he was in L.A. This is before he came home, I guess, and took the car. And he was went to some club. <laughs> and he said, I was running the club. I'm in the club. I'm telling everyone to come up and dance. And they're dancing. And and I think it was a black club. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I mean, which he shouldn't have been there in the first place. I mean, what lunatic just goes in a club that he doesn't know where he is and starts getting everyone to dance. Yeah. And, and nothing happened. I mean, yes. I. <laughs> like, again, how that transpired was I went on one of those tours of the Hollywood Hills. Okay. And I was up front with the guy getting everyone hyped. And then he basically told me, he's like, do you want to come to this club? And, you know, uh, it's, know it's been dying down okay. or we'd love to have you come and just hang out with everyone. So I was like, yeah, let's go. Because <laughs> in my mind, I was delusional. But at the, also the same time, in my mind, I was like, I'm going to take Christ to the club. I'm going to take my relationship with God to the club and I'm going to just, again, there's that faith component, but also this delusional component too. So I remember showing up to the club and like, it's early and there's not that many people there, but when you are manic, there's also a level of overconfidence that you do okay. not care or you're not worried about what someone might do, which is extremely dangerous because right. you could lead someone right. to do something no matter who it is. And I remember being in that club. And I even remember taking a picture on my like Facebook at that time. And I was like, it's about to go down. I'm going to get everyone pumped up. That was the thing. It was like, I'm just going to get right. everyone pumped up because before in Arizona, I went to one of the clubs and I wasn't drinking or anything. And I just like started this dance floor or this dance circle. And I was just getting everyone excited, you know? And it was like, my friend was with me and he was like, dude, that was insane. And I'm like, yeah, man, we got to get people excited, but it's not just about drinking or anything else. Uh, so I was at this club and <laughs> then people started showing up and all these people are like dancing and doing all these crazy moves. And I'm like, how am I going to compete with these people? But then I eventually came and I did another dance circle like that. And everyone was going crazy. And I'm like, wow, this is wild. I even remember going up to someone who had a table there. I literally, it's two people sitting there. I walk up to the table and I just <laughs> grab their water and pour myself a drink. So disrespectful. But when you're delusional and stuff, you think you can do anything. There's a, there's also this, like, you're a part of a big plan and you have this God-like concept, to do that, you know, right? where it's like, I'm a part of this plan. I'm here for a reason bigger and it's all delusional. So I put myself in a lot of dangerous situations. I got in cars with people who drove me to different places <laughs> and God obviously had his hand in favor of protecting me in those times. Cause you remember when I lost the car too, I was in right, a car with right. someone who was a Christian. Cause I, I talked to him a little bit. He's like, I'm going to wait here with you until your parents get here. Cause I left your car in a neighborhood and I walk out, get in another car. I don't even know. And I'm like, Oh, it's a part of this plan. And they're going to take me to this place. And then they take me all the way to the movie theaters and they drop me off there. It could have been a Lyft driver, or an Uber driver, but they were kind enough to take me there. I didn't have any money or anything at that time. So just seeing the things that I was willing to do and still having that protection over me was just... If, it, if people would have seen him who knew, they would all think he was a speed freak. They would think he's on speed. Oh, 100%. But that incident with the car took me back to an incident with my mother 
Mm. She was getting a little senile, I guess. She took off one day to go get her hair done. This is, they were living back in New Jersey when we were out here, obviously. Mm -hmm. And my cousin calls me in a panic that my mother went out and didn't come home. Mm. So she wound up calling every hospital, calling all the police stations, nothing. There's a knock on the door and these two guys come up with my mother. They were two gangbangers from Patterson, New Jersey. They had chains and tattoos and everything. And they said, oh, we found this lady on the side of the road sitting in her car, not knowing where she was. Mm. They could have taken the car. They could have taken, they were so, we were so grateful because one of those guys also had an incident with his mother. Mm. And it brought him back to that wow. time. So he brought her home. Hmm. But your incident with the car over there took me back to that. Interesting. Yeah. So when I got into the hospital and that all started happening, what was going through your mind at that time? Well, I think there was so much uncertainty. I mean, the doctors didn't know what was really going on in the beginning. They were medicating, you know, giving them, all, giving you all kinds of different drugs. Yeah. Uh, who was I to say, don't do that? I had no expertise in what you were going through. Uh, I just remember <laughs> Dane running up and down the halls, exercising. He still had that manic part going on, which I guess was a little positive. I mean, he was exercising, he was doing push-ups, and uh, but I, I was. My wife says I took it. I didn't do a good job handling it. Mm. I don't know. I didn't know how to react. Yeah. I mean, I don't think I would, I thought, is this going to last forever? Is he going to, you know, it was the uncertainty. Right. I mean, and Dane always talked about when he was younger, he, he, he was a guy who liked certainty, but obviously from what he do, d done in his life, he got out of that mode and went out of, outside of his comfort zone. But I, I had no idea what was going on. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you one little story and he'll laugh at this. He comes out and he says, Oh, guess what? I don't, you know where I'm going with this one? Mm -mm. He says, I met Leo. Mm. Leo who? DiCaprio. Oh, great. Yeah, he's taking me down to his private island. And I guess DiCaprio did have an island where yeah. he's going to do a hotel. So there was the, the, the connection there to reality. But Dane was under the illusion, or delusion, I guess, yeah. that he was going to go down there with him. Right. And he was so positive about it. That's, that's why we got very upset because he comes out when he's in the hospital and he's telling us his story. Yeah. And it's like, he's still there believing this. And you're saying, okay, I guess we got a way to go here. Yeah. And what was it? Two weeks or three weeks? You were in two there. weeks, two weeks. Yeah. And we'd go visit, I think every day, didn't we? Every day or. I, yeah, I think so. Um, and how was that when you were visiting me? What did you think? I mean, it, it's almost like you're there. And you were not relating to us in a, like a relatable way because you were still off into fantasy land. Yeah. So that was, it was disconcerting because, you know, you'd go and say, oh, we, maybe we can talk to him today and he'll be back to reality. And it, it kept not being that. Yeah. So it was, it, it was depressing. It was almost like I've never liked hospitals. Yeah. I was in a hospital when I was four years old having a hernia operation of all things. And the way they treated me as a young kid, they wouldn't give me dessert. I refused to eat the food and the nurse looks at me. <laughs> Think about this, guys. She says, if you're not going to eat your food, you're not getting dessert. How do you do that to a four-year-old kid? Right. So it left a lasting impression of hospitals. <laughs> um, yeah, so it was, the uncertainty was... What, what? Uncertain. You didn't yeah. know. We didn't know what was going to happen. Yeah. Was this permanent? Was it going to change? Was it going to go away? Were they telling you anything about what was going on or they did not know? They like... didn't really know. Okay. And then you started talking to one guy there, I think, that you started relating to. I can't remember his name. One of the doctors. Yeah. And that was sort of the beginning of spiraling out of the abyss, so yeah. to speak. Right? Yeah. I don't remember his name. I don't remember. Yeah, it was Fermo. Okay. And he was a psychiatrist there. And something that mom said too on the podcast last time was, 
when you got home, you weren't like back to normal. Do you remember <laughs> that when I got back out of the hospital? Oh, you were still, yeah, absolutely. Like still acting weird. And something that I think I've told you before, I was so delusional that yes, it's like the, the thinking you're involved in like these other people's lives, like Leonardo DiCaprio. The, right. And again, there's so much to this that sometimes it's hard to explain to people because Absolutely. it's straight, it's strictly delusional. You think things are happening that aren't happening. But what I also experienced before the hospital and after the hospital was not thinking you guys were you. Like right. thinking right. that mom, here's, here's another one that I've never shared. I remember when mom, cause she was so close to me during that time. And then you remember that day we went and played basketball? I was so delusional that I thought she was someone else in disguise and was like, I'm part of the whole plan. We're going to get you out of here. It's going to be all right. So I was like, like you said, couldn't relate. Right. I didn't even think she was my mom. That's how far delusional I was. And this was before I went into the hospital for the first time. Okay. So all this is going on, but you can't physically see that being someone who's just experiencing it. But this is how severe it gets. And then do you remember when we went to the the psychiatrist and they sat us down. Was that the first, like the psychiatrist that was out of the hospital that we went to, that they did the brain map on me and we sat down oh, and they okay. showed us at that point, did they, you did were you out of the hospital? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. At that point, did you know that it was like mental health illness, bipolar disorder one, or was that the first time you heard it when they showed us the brain map? I think that might've been the first time. Okay. Right. And when you saw that, what did you think? Well, that guy, that doctor, I mean, I used to see him when I hiked every day. He used to hike with yeah. his dog. And um, I liked the guy, but I didn't like the fact that he says, oh, see this, your brain is there. You're never going to get better. You're always going to be on medication. So I didn't, I don't like medication, as you know. I don't take any medic, really. Yeah. But I, that turned me off Okay. when he said that. And I think it turned you off a little because you said, no, that's not going to be the way it is. Yeah. And uh, we went there one or two times, three times maybe, and that was it. And then yeah. after that, you tell me again what happened to you after that meeting Yeah. So those meetings. Yeah, it was probably a couple of weeks after getting that diagnosis, but I think mom was a huge encouragement point. And I was going to church with her too of saying like, you're going to get through this. Like, this isn't going to be the rest of your life. Like, you're going to be healed. You're going to be healed. And I said, okay, like, let me. And I think part of some of my outlook I already had going into that too was I've turned things around in the past. Uh, okay. I've gotten my life together. Right. I'm going to turn it around again. But I believe that this is something that doesn't have a cure. It is medically, uh, it, met, it happens to someone, happens to 1% of the population but I'm also a believer and I believe God can heal me. And my mom is telling me that too. So I'm going to believe that. And then. But you were, you were under the impression that it doesn't go away. Yes. So I wasn't blind to the, cer like to the circumstance was, of right. this is what I need to do now. But right. I was like, there's no way this is going to be my life forever. Like <laughs> I believe I'll be able to get through this because she is so certain. Right. So I can get some certainty right. in that after this insane trauma I just went through in this hospital, like even what, what happened in that hospital is almost too difficult to explain because people would be like, that is so yeah, crazy. Exactly. So crazy. Even the first night, which I might write a book about in the future, <laughs> but people will be like, what? This is wild. That's why I don't share all of those well, things necessarily. Just, just to add something, think how difficult it is for so-called normal people to relate on a very open on a spaces. Yeah. I mean, you know, just in general living. Yeah. Take that and extrapolate to what you went through. You can't relate. Not at you all. Can't. And that's why I think after going through all of that, it was really hard for me to talk about it. And I never talked about it with others for I, like six I years why. because I think I had to emotionally heal from that trauma right. of that darkness and everything that happened. Uh, but when I got that diagnosis, did you believe that that was going to be the rest of my life? How did you think about that when they say, this is a mental health illness that has no cure, right? This is the facts scientifically. How did you think about that or my future? Two parts. My wife is much more religious. I, I don't like the word religious, but more faith-based than I am. Yeah. I mean, I believe, but I'm not oh, we can get miracles. We can get miracles. She's much more in that camp. Mm -hmm. 
So her being there, giving him all this encouragement was the utmost importance. Yeah. When I heard, you know, I'm not a big believer and you have to go get the flu shot all the time. You know, science is, I think uh, our medical system is crazy and they push drugs like crazy. Yeah. So I'm not in that camp where I think you take drugs for everything. But when a, a professional tells you this is something that you're going to have the rest of your life, I, I don't know if I was there to question it. I, mm -hmm. I think, okay, maybe Dane's going to have to take drugs for the rest of his life to control us. Yeah. So I was, I was more over this way and my wife was more, no, it's going to, it's going to go away. Yeah. So that's sort of where I was. And I think it's an interesting balance between both of yours, your, your guys' perspectives of the situation, because some people think one way, some people think of it the other way. Let me ask you this. So I think that this whole thing that happened to me was primarily like an attack because again, like you said, mom and I are really strong in our faith. Right. And we believe we live in a supernatural world and it was like an attack uh, spiritually because we don't have like this mental health illness or we haven't seen anyone in our family get it. Right, so how right. did it happen to me or why me right out of all the other kids? Uh, but where, cause I- So well, let me interject. So you think it was an attack on you probably more so than the other kids because you had more faith. So it was attack attack because you were a, a more faith based person. Not necessarily. No? Okay. I just think uh, there was a lot going on in my life and I think the enemy does come to attack in certain ways. And I think the way in which he attacked me was based on how my mind was created which is it's fast, it processes things well. <laughs> right. So when that attack came from the enemy, it was like, the thing is, and mom and I talk about this too, if we're believers in Jesus, we believe in the authority we have based on what he did in the cross. And what that gives us is all authority over the enemy. But at that time I was ignorant of it. I right. didn't understand okay. it. So when that attack came, I was like, what is this? Because I was, again, learning and all this other stuff. I was like, what is this? Like, I don't know what this is. Like, I didn't rebuke it or resist it or stand firm in my faith against it. I kind of let it come, opened that door up, and then it completely ruined and warped everything that was going on. And it manifested itself in the form of Let me ask you a quick question. Illness. Since time goes so fast as you're getting older like I am. Yeah. How many years ago was that? It was like 10 years ago. 10 years ago. It was okay. a long time. Yeah. Like I said, time goes so fast. I right. Mean, okay. So I think it was like, because you know how people have mental health illness in their family. Right. Like this, right. this kid has it, this yep. kid has it, and it yep. passes all the way down. Yep. But then something like this happens where it's like, Anom how did this happen? An anomaly. I think because mental health illness is still uh, so misunderstood. And if I believe that we live in a spiritual world, I believe the enemy can attack us too. And he can attack us in many different ways. And I think he attacked me in my mind. Right. And then it spiraled into this thing. And it was very dark because the things that I went through, <laughs> not just the grandiose things, the darkness that yeah. I felt, like even one time being in a room and, and just sitting there like quietly and I was listening to some music and I had my eyes like not fully closed. And I had, there's a dark figure just across the room sitting there right with me. And instead of going like rebuking it and speaking and against that, right. it, I was like, what is that? Right. What is that? <laughs> and like, again, I, I think it's so, the enemy's so manipulated in that way, but I really think this was so much like demonic oppression. And I know where you stand on these things, but do you think it was more, do you think it could be that? Not just the- Absolutely, it could be that. Right. Yeah. Because then the reason I say that is two weeks later after getting that diagnosis at the doctor's office, it was two or three weeks later. I'm pretty sure it was two. I went to church, pastor, uh, you know, they, they lay hands on me. Right. My hands start shaking uncontrollably. Then I start making a weird noise out of my mouth <laughs> and they start freaking out, right. praying for me in real time. And I'm sitting there not saying anything because I'm experiencing this. And in my mind, I'm going, I'm being healed right now. And they're going, well, they're going to still keep praying. And they pray and I feel something lifted off me. And again, you could think, well, Dane, you were delusional at that time. This was so present right. that I could not think anything else because I was also taking medication and I wasn't as wildly- So you were still on it then. Yeah, I was on that medication and it, you know, gained 20 pounds, 
didn't feel the same. Felt <laughs> I lost everything, but I presently felt that move and like God move in that supernatural way. And after they prayed for me, I was like, I was just healed. I was just healed. Go up to the pastor after, and he still freaked out and goes, I got to get my daughter a donut. That's what he said I'm and walked glad away. You told that part. I got to get my daughter a donut. <laughs> and in my mind, I'm not mad about it. I'm just like, praise the Lord. I was healed. Go get her so, donut. I'm feeling fine. <laughs> yeah. And I bring that up because I, tr I truly believe without a shadow of a doubt, based on what I witnessed, yes, I had a mental health illness that had no cure, but I was healed. Right. Like supernaturally, because what is the, what is the only other way to explain it? Right. I got off all the medication within weeks. Right. And it's been over 10 years. And do you remember when I said like my brain was slow? Right. It was that really slow. I, I lost everything. All came back. Took a little time, but it all came back. So because of experiencing that in church and like <laughs> seeing God move and being prayed for, there's nothing else I can believe, at least to this point in my life, that that wasn't God being able to heal me. And I share that with you because, again, we're all at different places in our walk. But what do you make of, or what is your interpretation or thought process of me getting off all the medication and nothing else happening ever again? Well, I think I'd be, I would be delusional if I didn't think there was some divine intervention. Yeah. Um, unless you're the one in 10 million that have what you had and don't need medication. Right. I just that, figured that, out how to deal exactly, with it. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So that, that, that's where I come out. Okay. Yeah, there had to be. Yeah. Had to be. Right. Yeah, I definitely think that. And uh, so when you hear these stories about miracles, I was always very skeptical because, you know, they this happened and they stood up and got out of the wheelchair and you hear all these stories. But maybe I'm like doubting Thomas. Mm -hmm. I had to see something myself. Yes. And then I see what happened to you and my eyes get a little wider and I think, OK, there is something going on here. Yeah. Besides him being the one in 10 million that just toughed it out. Right. He doesn't need medication. Totally. Yeah. yeah. That's definitely where, um, I just, I can't see it any other way. And I think that's cool for our whole family to experience really because it was a really dark time. And I that's think an understatement. And for <laughs> me being the competitive one or we're all competitive in the family, I would always say to myself, I'm like, I'm going to do the most. I'm going to do right, this and this right. and this. And then I get this derail. And why does all this happen to me? Right. And then everyone else is just witnessing this. And it's just, but it's, it could have really taking the, that aside, what happened in church, it could have derailed you for the rest of your life. A hundred percent. It does. It does this to people. And this is why I think understanding your identity is really important because mom helped me with that too. When I was diagnosed with this mental health illness, I never spoke it over my life. I said, this is the situation now. This will not be the rest of my life because my identity lies in what the word of God says right. about me. And I really think that matters because when people go through mental health crises and it affects their life, it almost creates this sense of because of how it's presented to you from doctors and stuff. Okay. This is now your new life. Right. Welcome to it. Believe it embody it. That's a good And point. I think that's a part of the process of helping someone get through it. That is really difficult when they start believing it and believing it. Cause I've had conversations with people about this, even with ones who aren't believers. And they said, this is still you. And I'm like, what do you mean? It's still me. They're like, it's like, if you need a pill for something, because there's an imbalance in your brain, you've got to take it. So that person's mindset is made up because their identity isn't what they believe about what has happened to them or what they've seen. So they project that onto me too, to say, nope, you might think you are, but you still need the medication. And I'm sitting there going, it's been years at the time when I would have these conversations. It's been two years, it's been three years, it's been five years. Well, think about how many of those folks too are predetermined to do what they're doing because of the way they were conditioned being brought up or totally just our societal inculcation of different ideas of what you should do. Right. Yeah. You know, it's like going back to what we were talking about before. When I went to college, you'd went four years. Yeah. Look where it is now. Yeah. Six, seven, maybe. I don't know. Right. You see football players in college. They're 24 years old. Are you yeah. kidding me? Right. I graduated late too. I, yeah. I did two years in community college, two years off, came back to two came back for the two years and then got derailed right at the end and then came <laughs> back and finished though. Right. You know, and that's when my technology career right. started, which was great. Um, exactly. And I think that's important what you said, because I think 
the way in which you and mom approached the situation was so beneficial because I've had conversations with other people who their kids go through this crisis and their parents kick them out of the house. What? They kick them out of the house because they think they're on drugs. They think they're crazy oh, oh, okay. and they abandon them. How difficult or what would have happened if when I was going through that, you guys were like, no, get out of here. We, you, you, there's clearly something wrong with you. And who would have, who would have known knowing where my mind was at? I would go right. wherever I would go. Right. So you it's just, be, you could be dead now. I know. And if that's that. happened to people who have had mental health illness and ones that we even know personally in our family. So it's just, it's really difficult. And I think that's something that you and mom did a great job of is trying to protect, not trying to necessarily understand because you didn't, we you didn't, knew what you right, knew. Exactly. It's just like, how do we keep, and this is what mom said. How do we keep them safe? How do we keep them safe? And then, you know, I take the car and I could have crashed it, flipped it over the road. I was going 70 miles up that Turnpike, so <laughs> it's just absolutely wild. And um, what I find, it, why we're blessed in a sense, in my mind, is you hear so many stories about families. The kids don't like the parents. The parents don't like the kids anymore. And there's so much uh, dysfunction among families mm -hmm. that you see. Yeah. And when I think of our family, I don't see any of that. Yeah. I mean, we don't even fight over right much yeah we're very close we're yeah. very close and so we're very lucky yeah i totally agree with that last question i'm going to ask you and then we can wrap up for other families going through this whether it's the dad the mom a sibling witnessing this through another sibling what would your advice be if you could sit down with them and talk to them for a couple minutes of what you would share with them based on what you've gone through and what you've learned and what you've seen well first of all they have to be patient yeah I mean, you don't know a timeline. Mm -hmm. There's no set timeline for people getting better from certain things. Mm. Obviously, your timeline was pretty quick. Yeah. Maybe someone will take a little longer. Mm. Maybe in some cases, if they're not, don't have faith like you did, the sibling or child or whatever may be needing medication for the rest of their lives. Yeah. And if that is the only answer they can come up with, well, then so be it. Then they have to do that. Mm. Uh, right? How many people are on medication for what you went through and they're in their 40s, 50s, 60s? Yeah. So you got to be patient. You got to, you know, open your heart. I mean, if it's your kid or your sibling or your parents, I mean, I, I don't know if it hits parents at an older age like that, but be diligent in being patient and love whoever you're dealing with. Yeah. If you don't, it's going to be a spiral that is going in the wrong direction right. for those folks. Patience is a great word to wrap around that. And I think it does help to, happen to older folks because look at what happened to grandma. Oh, that's a that good point. That was a point. whole that's crisis. A point, and, yeah. You know, there are even people who have said to me, Dane, that was a generational curse that went down your family line from your grandma to you, but it ended with you and it will not affect your family. And even if I believe that or not, in the generational right, curse passing right. to me, I'm like, whatever, it's broken. It's not going to affect <laughs> right. me anymore because it hasn't and it won't affect my line. So whatever that right. might be, because, you know, we try to make sense of things, of how they happened. Right. And mom's more so, it was an attack, right. but you beat it. So right. I'm like, great. And the <laughs> Lord healed you. Awesome. Amen. So I appreciate you coming in and having a chat about this. I know it was, it's different for us all, but I appreciate you hearing this, uh, hearing your side of the, the story and your feedback. So thank you for coming in. Oh, you're welcome. It was fun. Awesome.